we've talked about the villages and so forth, that some of the kind of dwellings that were used. Well, there were a lot of trees around here, so they built bark lodges. And in such one of those kind of shelters, you might say, was I was my birthplace. There was a bark lodge. So I'll talk about the bark lodge first. Here I have some cuts showing bark lodges. And uh, here's one that was built in 38, 1938, and uh, begins to show that they quit building bark lodges and they were losing their art artisty, artistry in uh, building bark lodges, according to this old cut. Uh, there were poles, or saplings, you might say, very strong ones built in a, they were pounded in the ground in a circular form and bent at the top to sort of form a big uh, half a hemisphere or something, you know, like a ball cut in half. And they had their doorway in there. Of course, the top part was left open for the smoke to escape. Now this framework work was covered with bark being peeled from a tree. I guess it was the idea uh, that started them making plywood and so forth. They knew they could take the annual rings and so forth and spread them out, and it made a big sheet. So these bark were gotten uh, when the sap starts to run in the spring of the year, and they they would cut around the bottom of the tree and so far above, so many feet up, and then they slid it down there and pound on it a little bit and loosen the bark and appeal the whole thing. Of course, the tree's gonna eventually die because it lost its bark. And these were laid in an orderly manner on this framework, and they were tied down again to, to the framework with some other poles on the outside uh, so that the wind would not lift them off and blow them away. Uh, they were lived in in summertime, also in wintertime. Uh, I imagine they were pretty warm. I didn't, although I was born in one, I, I don't remember of living in one all winter because we had a log cabin when I really uh, become conscious of where I was. I remember trying to climb a log cabin at the corners of the building there where they were a good place to climb, you know. So I don't remember of living inside one of these bark lodges in the winter. And uh, other types, uh, we have another cut here showing the same kind of framework, only they have the reed the weed uh, or rushes, bull rushes, or whatever you call them, they grow along the uh, ponds, and some call them cattail reeds, uh, so forth. These were laced together, uh, intricately woven and held together by twine. Uh, and these also were used for summer camps. Uh, I mean, they, the building, the framework was covered with, instead of having thatching, they, they used these to uh, complete the wigwam. So beside these here, we had log cabins, we had uh, caves. Even one guy's name was Mochiga. He means that he let, lives in the ground, but he happened to uh, be a bear clan name, so maybe he had a den somewhere in the hills, and so he was named Mochiga, uh, lives in the earth. Or he might have been the snake clan. You couldn't tell exactly from that name why he was called the in-earth dweller. 
Uh, and then, of course, I forgot about Uncle Sam. He came along, and he was, he was building uh, buildings for the chiefs, though, to start with, half brick and half frame. So now that we've got got to talk about these buildings and so forth, now I'm just going to talk about. Uh, few incidents in my early life. I said that he was running away from, uh, I guess you'd call him a truant officer today. This education man would uh, journey down here into the Big Bear Hollow area, Honey Creek area, Big Belly Town to see if uh, there's any children down there school age and he's going to take him and send him off to school. Well, it so happened that they knew that my mother, who was of another tribe, was teaching me at home the reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, so they didn't bother me very much uh, as to going to school right then. So I had the happy opportunity of uh, chomping the woods and so forth, and and such that uh, I knew where squirrels were and where the honeybee trees were in my area. So my uncles would come down from out uh, maybe west of town or Winnebago or out on the prairies and say, well, nephew, we come down to hunt squirrels. Now, where are the squirrels? So then he'd, uh, well, I said, uh, let, let me think. How many are you that want squirrels? And they said, well, there's Two of us here come after squirrels, okay. So he'll turn to his partner and he said, this nephew of mine, he, he, he knows where the squirrels are. He just mark my word. So I guess that was kind of to soak me up or butter me up a little bit. So I used the best deal where the squirrels were. And I said, oh, yeah, there's two of you. Well, I said, we go over here. Sure enough, we get over there and they get their bag limit. And, and so on the way back, he said, I told you my nephew knows, he knows everything. If you want to find out what's down here, just ask him. And so then we come around again, maybe they'll ask about the bee trees. Well, how many are you that want honey? You know, well, that's, that's even me. There's two of us here and there's, we, we're representing uh, these families over there. So I take them somewhere and cut a tree down and get get enough honey for that bunch of people. And so they, I was fortunate, I guess, that I picked the right trees for them. So then I had this kind of experience here. It's kind of like uh, when I went to school, I started hearing about Hiawatha. I thought that there, there's a guy that had had a lot of fun, like something like I did, but I didn't have any mini ha ha's and so forth in my in my life up to that time. So and come the time that I had to go to school. Well in the meantime I lived with my grandparents, my mother and father. And the grandparents had to be there all the time. They were supervising my Indian education, uh, which I suppose clan-wise or because of the family status that they had, was I had to be taught certain things, which was uh, not taught to other boys. So these things that I had to learn, and one of them was about uh, being a good person, being a person uh, that has a good heart, uh, the things that I should do in order to get that kind of uh, rating. And at the same time, uh, I guess it was somewhat of an early training towards chieftainship. And because the grandma used to tell me how long it took to really uh, develop a person to a point where he was 
eligible to be a chief or had the all the credits and so forth of uh, being appointed chief if they had to have a ch another chief or replace one. So it took many years, uh, deep thought and fasting and just training to be a good person. Because the chief at that time we used to be one who had uh, love for his people. He looked out for their welfare. He had to think ahead and plan for the people and so forth, like droughts coming along. Well, then he'd say, you know, my children, uh, we're going to have a hard summer here. Corn might not be so plentiful, so you just get out there and do the best you can and, and, and prepare for a shortage. Well, he had to be weatherman, uh, everything, public health. But anyhow, this is what happened uh, after studying or listening to Grandma and Grandpa tell me all these things, and then we went to school. So it seemed like I started school kind of late, too, uh, that year, and I went to the kindergarten. And they were having uh, Thanksgiving programs and so forth, like they do yet today. And so in this case, they were going to portray the Puritans or the pilgrims and the Indians sitting down at a big feed there. So the teacher said that I was to be chief. And so give me my part and what I had to say and so forth. Uh, but I was kind of, uh, well, so they did something to me. So I went home that evening and I told my mother that in two days I went to school and I became chief. When Grandma told me it'd take years of learning to, to be eligible for chief. So I guess I must have got my lesson pretty good there, so I made chief in two days. Ever since then, I've been chief nuisance to everybody. All right, as I said here visiting with you, I'm going to talk about the administration building, the government representative's office there, and about the hospital. And there's another shot of the hospital uh, through the fence and trees that used to surround this uh, uh, reserve. Now, th these buildings were put here sometime in the early or the late 1900s or the 1800s because uh, in the treaty it stipulates that... Uh, it would have a school uh, and a flour mill, a grist mill, they call it that time, and sawmill. Uh, uh, different things was promised in the treaty that the government would place on the reservation. So these are some of the things that were carried out. Here the agent at that time, they call him the Indian agent. He, he held sway. This was his throne room, you might say. He had the clerks and uh, accountants in there and any uh, horse doctors he had or something, boss farmer. And this, of course, was a health part of it, so they built a hospital. But as my understanding, prior to this becoming a hospital and uh, the agency, uh, the agency buildings were located elsewhere, and uh, that was given up. And when the school closed, they called it an industrial school, I guess because they were tra uh, teaching them trades, how to be farmers, 
how to be a white man, how to be anything. So when the school closed, well, then the agency proper moved into these buildings because they were uh, much better and more bigger rooms and so forth. So that the, the hospital was the first to go on this reservation. It was rad some years back because they built a new hospital in, uh, in town, in the town or village of Winnebago. Just recently, the edifice that we call the agency, the agent's office was torn down because, and uh, a new one built. Well, the question was asked, were the uh, dealings of the agent uh, up and above board? Well, there were suspicion or suspicions that things were not really done according to Hoyle by the agent, such as transferring of funds and uh, when it comes to inheritance, some of the heirs who are legally entitled to inherit from a deceased person, uh, when it comes to probate, where they didn't even uh, inherit a thing. Someone else got it. So there was a lot of underhanded uh, things that could have been carried on, but we I personally never had gotten any uh, facts and so forth in hand that uh, we could even come out and accuse somebody and take them to court. So this goes along with the thinking that we have in the movies today that that Indian agent is a is a so and so uh, and is ripping the tribe off and. Is, in cahoots with a bunch of renegades somewhere, which I guess is quite true, but we could never get a hold of the proper evidence to prosecute these boys. I call them the boys because if they were men, they wouldn't, wouldn't have acted the way they did. They, were, they hadn't grown up yet. Uh, one more thing to uh, add on to this discussion here, or I don't know. This uh, was called the Hungo Chi, which uh, is the house of the chief. I don't know if that was a humorous uh, kind of a adverse humorous uh, name given to this building or something, but it's the chief's house. Well, the agent was not the chief, but the, this is what they called it. And so on certain days that their funds arriving from uh, their leasing of their property and the agent would put the funds in their individual money account and so then it's doled out maybe monthly or every Monday so much, they get so much. And to carry him out through the year, so the the saying was, "I'm going to the chief's house to get get my money." Well, some of the things, uh, other questions to answer those questions was, did they like what kind of treatment the superintendent gave them or the agent? Today they call him a superintendent. Those days he was the Indian agent, and uh, that was a dirty name. And so, how did they like it? Well, I've heard uh, some say that uh, we should go back to the Red Cedar Fence place. They were, were referring to the concentration camp from which they had escaped a few years prior to this time. And then some others would say, well, I'd rather go back to Turkey River. Well, where's Turkey River? That's in northeast Iowa. Uh, that area they ceded back to the government in 1847. Now that's a long time, but but they're talking about this back in the 1900s now. That I'd rather be be back over there. 
the treatment we got over there was would have been a lot better than we're getting now. So they were kind of disgruntled with the uh, way the administration of their business was carried on here. And adding one more thing is uh, why were the Winnebago's uh, treated thus as kind of an overall thought on my part is that uh, during the French and Indian Wars, the Winnebago's were fighting with the colonies. All right, and uh, France and England got into a fight, and the Winnebago's were with the French, and the English won out. The bloody English won that war, and so then later on, the Winnebago's had to side in with the British when the British start fighting the colonies in the revolution. Up to the year 1812, uh, the battles that were being fought to Winnebago's was always on the losing end of it there. I guess it seemed like to me that they went out to fight because they just liked to fight. But because the Winnebago's had fought against the colonies and the United States, I think, after the treaty was made, although we forgive you and you forgive us and we're going to be buddy-buddy from here on out. Uh, Uncle Sam didn't like it because some of his whiskers were pulled by the Winnebago's and he saw to it that certain things didn't come out just right for the Winnebago's all through history, right up to today. And if he's someplace and he don't like it, he can come and see me. I'll pull the other side out. Hello. Uh, today, the, in these hills somewhere, buried the remains of a mysterious sort of a fellow by the name of Chief Little Priest. We don't know why they call him priest. Maybe it was because of his uh, mannerisms and uh, profound activity towards peaceful movements. But Little Priest was born somewhere in Wisconsin, uh, particularly in the south uh, east part of the the end of Lake Winnebago uh, back in 1828 or 27, somewhere. Uh, but he was reared in that area of Wisconsin, uh, the south portion of Lake Winnebago, in the aboriginal country of the Winnebago's at that time. and. Uh, Well, really, I wasn't there, but uh, the way to a boy of his type of person, he had to go through the training that uh, the tribe at that time uh, considered uh, a form of education. Uh, so that way we, we will see or we'll talk about it and so that we'll see what what uh, education he had uh, as far as the Indian culture. Uh, first, a boy must uh, be impressed upon uh, his, the impressions made upon him that he is number one, he is going to be a soldier, a warrior, and of course he start out with being a hunter first. So it depends on your uh, ability to outsmart the animals uh, so you'd never be hungry. So we can imagine little priests being taught the art of hunting, tracking, uh, and also conservation, as you didn't just needlessly kill any animal you killed him or it for food. 
So that, you know, our boys are, some get carried away and they'd like to sh shoot more or kill more game than the next guy. But the, the, the rules were you killed only that which you needed. So we might find little priest being uh, subjected or exposed to experiences in hunting and he also tracking. And so back at home, uh, his elders may have taught him uh, the lessons of being, trying to grow up to be a man. Uh, today we have the slang, he, to, just to be people. And so maybe this way, and then he, when he reached the age of maybe 12, why he was supposed to go out and fast to seek visions uh, for what purpose he was, became a human being. Uh, so these procedures went on and on, and if you didn't get a vision or didn't have a, a shocking dream of some sorts, or you repeated your fast. So it is said that little priest was a um, almost a perpetual faster. He did not just have uh, one session, maybe two, three, but he just kept on going. He was seeking the answer, what am I here for? And so somewhere in his fast, the answer must have come back that he was here for peace. His existence on earth was a messenger of peace. And maybe this is where uh, he might have been preaching, you might say, like we say today, talking about living harmoniously with everybody, nature, other people. And so he he may have been called Little Priest. He was young. Little, in the Indian word uh, translation, can mean a young person, a little. Uh, just like we say the old people are the big people because of their amount of experience and wisdom gathered by many years. Well, now we have little priests there uh, in that area doing uh, the thing that uh, developed him, his mind and thinking to work for peace. And so I guess we use the big word uh, here that he was a protagonist for peace and uh, at any cost. So it so happened that in 1837, when the last portion of the Aboriginal territory was ceded to the government, uh, some of the people were very much upset by that treaty, and they tried to say it was null and void because they didn't have uh, the right amount of clansmen of certain clans that uh, made up a negotiating committee to talk about the land. This is something new where they said, this is your land and we want to you to give it up and we will give you some land elsewhere. Uh, because the Indians thought on this was that land belonged to everybody. It was not owned by any individuals. So now we find the people are somewhat upset and maybe disgruntled at their chiefs or headmen that went to Washington and had something to do with finally submitting to the government and sign, signing them that treaty. And so being as young as he was, he was uh, 
either elected or appointed by the, his clan and so forth to take the place of someone else on the consul. And so we find his name on the, the first time. We find Hunk Hunuga written on the Treaty of 1846, which was the ceding of the neutral territory in Northeast Iowa. Uh, they ceded that to the government and uh, moved northward to St. Cloud, Minnesota in that area, and then later on these other treaties come along. But about time they were at Blue Earth, Minnesota, why the uh, Sioux Uprising came along, and then little priest and his band were uprooted from their homes there and sent to Fort Thompson, South Dakota, in Dakota Territory at that time, and were imprisoned for doing nothing but being Winnebago Indians in the state of Minnesota. So these uh, experiences and uh, the experiences that he saw his people suffer before from the time the lead hungry people came to Illinois or the Indian Winnebago country. So. After escaping from South Dakota, the Fort Thompson, they came down the Missouri to this part of the country. And uh, before treaty talk or uh, any land settlement agreements being made, he thought in a manner that uh, if he would carry out this thinking, he would. Uh, sort of create peace between the pioneers, the soldiers, and the Indians of this area. So taking 70 men with him, or asking for volunteers, and 70 of them volunteered to go with him to join the Army as scouts. So being at Decatur, Nebraska, they began there on February 25th, the chief or the leader, Little Priest, went to Omaha and volunteered his services to scout for the United States Army. And then the other men followed, and they were mustered into service on May 3rd, 1865. And they were mustered in for a service of one year. And so this, during this time, we had Pawnee scouts and other big Indian fighters out in the West there, and famous two-gun slingers. But we had Chief Little Priest from this area. Uh, with his men, they made the scouts, what they call the Company A, the Omaha Scouts, the Nebraska Volunteers. Oh, it's a long title. But uh, strangely, it must have been that our Nebraskan historian slipped up somewhere, and uh, I don't believe he even mentioned Little Priest and his men, which was uh, in itself the men participating uh, in the scouting expedition, they, they had stories of all types, what happened, and so where it happened, we do not know, but we're, we're someday we get it all together and we'll put the Indian stories where they belong on the itinerary of this war journey. Okay, now we got as far as the volunteers uh, being mustered in and, and so forth. But uh, I'm going to explain a little bit here <coughs> that this contingent was known as the Omaha Scouts, the Nebraska Volunteers, and Company A. Uh, there's been some misunderstanding in 
these past years about the title Omaha Scouts. They went to Fort Omaha and volunteered. And besides, they came from the Omaha country, say, at Decatur, Nebraska. This was before the 1865 treaty was signed that this movement began. And so they came from the Omaha country and they went to Omaha at Fort Omaha and volunteered. And so out of that Company A, Nebraska Volunteers, the Omaha Scouts, they called them. Now, I don't know what they, they believed that there were Omahas at that time or because they were coming out of Fort Omaha, they were named the Omaha Scouts. But I assure you on the roster, uh, they placed the natives of the individual volunteer was Wisconsin. And so all the volunteers in that portion were native of. We even had some from a uh, few in that uh, outfit that were from New York. And, and we had a few limeys in there too. And so forth, I say that jokingly. Uh, but because they call, were called Omaha Scouts, our friends to the south here, the Omaha tribe for a long time believed that uh, these were members of their tribe that formed this uh, troop. Uh, but that is not so. They were all Winnebago's. There was not one Omaha tribal member in this contingent. So we get this thing straight now. This is why I think that Mr. Sheldon, I believe his name, may he rest in peace, he for, forgot somewhere and didn't men, make mention of uh, the Omaha Scouts, but he said plenty about the Pawnee Scouts under the North Brothers' command. So now that this sets the record straight, I hope. And all members of the uh, when, uh, Omaha Scouts were Winnebago's, and many of them had, uh, doing this trick, had uh, sort of adopted songs, or maybe uh, songs were composed to commemorate a certain thing that uh, maybe the individual uh, in his action, did certain things, uh, so the, the song was composed in his, to honor that certain act. Now, when, uh, when we come back here, uh, in the last few years, there had been quite a, a controversy as to whether they were Omaha tribal songs, war songs, or they were Winnebago songs. And so surely the Omahas have reason to believe that they were Omaha songs because they come from the Omaha Scouts group. Now we got that part on the record. I hope there's no more argument about whose song they are because the wording in the songs are also Winnebago. When we get to teach you all the Winnebago language and the Omahas teach you how to speak Omaha, then you can understand the songs and you say, sure enough, they are Winnebago songs. Ugh, I have spoken on that part. Now, getting back to Little Priest. Uh, well, prior to the fast and so forth, we have little things that's we think this might be important uh, because the, the boys were uh, going to fast and so forth. They had to have a brave spirit, not afraid of the dark and so forth. So you gradually different little rituals take place. At this time I'll talk about the turtle heart.
Uh, I wasn't going to make mention of this, but I, I, I also went through the uh, process of becoming a brave uh, by this turtle heart. The deal was that you, uh, the one who is going to, well, want to be brave, want to be a person hard to kill, and so forth. So he will be expected to swallow a turtle's heart while it is still palpitating. And uh, depends on whether you keep it down wherever the things go when you swallow and, and, and conquer that palpitation within your carcass or something, you know. Uh, if you can do that, then you have reached a point where you are begin to discipline yourself, to control yourself. It, your mind is over matter, regardless of what, maybe there's a uh, bear eating on your leg and you wasn't supposed to holler out or something like that. You, you probably could do that or have some something happening to you. And you wasn't, if you were not supposed to yell out and cry in pain, you have disciplined yourself. So we went through this turtle heart swallowing ritual. A uh, little priest probably went through that. I know, I'm pretty sure he did because this is uh, one of the, I say, process of uh, the psychology uh, developing the idea that your mind is super and it, it controls everything, but the individual also must control his mind, have self-control. So a little priest probably went through this here. I say probably because that was a must. It give the boy a sense of, uh, I swallowed the heart while it was moving and I kept it down. Uh, I passed that test. So from here on out, I'm going to be brave. I will not be afraid of the dark. I have become something. So there are different little rituals like that as gradually they build up a person's, uh, uh, well, the makeup of a person. That's all they also, as a boy, they probably taught them war games, uh, wrestling, and all kinds of uh, combat tactics, marksmanship, uh, self-control, and how to go through the woods without stepping on sticks and making any sound. You could be stealthily come right up on some deer or some other animal that you were hunting. But they, they tried and practice this thing. So uh, although little priest was a man of peace, uh, he was just as rough as they come when it comes to uh, battle tactics. So uh, I'm trying to say that he went through all the tests and developed himself to be the kind of fellow he was. And uh, to me, uh, the overall life of Little Priest, he was a, a kind of a mysterious personage to me. I hear of the stories about Little Priest. So now we have, uh, we have this troop on the march. We have some humorous stories about the march what the individuals did. It seemed like the army uh, 
sort of lo loosened up on its uh, regulations as to how you dressed. There's some comical stories about the uh, the Pawnees did the same thing. The those buck privates they didn't have any chevrons or rank mark on their uniforms, they would cut the sleeves off and just use the others for kind of a jacket vest. They put feathers in their hats. Uh, I guess the Winnebago's went a step further. They would take and cut the seat out of a pair of pants and made leggings out of the, the pants legs and, and throw the seat away. Their boots, uh, they would cut the sole part off and, and use them for uh, little short leggings. They slip them over their moccasins. At first, they would ride ride bareback on the horses that they had, and finally they used army saddles for, I suppose, uh, to tie on their bedding and other things. So at the first review, uh, I understand that uh, the reviewing general from the east came and saw this troop of Winnebago's go by, and uh, sort of, I guess he was shocked. He says, what is this? So, well, somebody was, must have been there to hear that because I wouldn't have heard it, but uh, I don't know where that story comes from. We have little stories here and there, Indian jokes about the Indian soldiers, and so the source of which we don't know, so we'll just go on. But now the troops left Omaha on the 3rd of May, 1865, and they were ordered to go out to Fort Laramie, which is north of, uh, well, red west of Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. So not knowing much about their movements or their travels, uh, we can't hardly come up with a story to say this took place there, and uh, this story take, takes place a few miles over here to spot it. And we're still working on the the itinerary that uh, this troop made. Uh, I have some notes on uh, towards the end of their uh, service time. Uh, incidentally, they were in service or mustered in for 12 months and they served 14. Somewhere the communications didn't get through, but towards the end, uh, the request has come into the War Department that the that the Winnebago Scouts be permitted to keep the ponies that they had captured in battle. I guess they must have hit the jackpot when they fought with the Arapahoes somewhere up in the. Tongue River, there they had plenty of horses. But that part was refused because the army needed horses, and I suppose that's why they refused to let them have these ponies as private property when they were mustered out. There was a deal, okay, they were at a Tongue River. Uh, one Winnebago soldier or vol volunteer was killed by, I think he's, his name was Little Bird. Uh, that brings up the story about uh, Little Priest now and the mysteriousness of this man. At the outset of this volunteering deal, he asked for volunteers. I said, before you volunteer, I am making you this promise. All of you that come with me to go out here and play like men the game, 
a game uh, the men play, uh, I will bring you home. And strangely as it was then, this one fella stood up and he said, it will not be so, chief or my leader. He said, I'm going to go along with you to place myself on the field of battle for the birds. And then another man stood up and he also said the same thing. So these two men were killed on the battle, on the battlefields, and he brought the rest of them all home. So now, I, I don't know, maybe it sounds kind of fishy that someone would have these powers of seeing in the future and tell you before you start what he's going to do. So those two men he, he left behind. Uh, when, they, when they finally came back. Now there's other stories about little priests that, uh, well, it sounds like a myth. But being so many of them that repeated this story that uh, I guess I'll have to uh, tell it now, as strange as it is going to be. <coughs> uh, somewhere out there in the Powder River campaigns or towards the end of the campaign, little priest had uh, become separated from his men, maybe he sensed the presence of some of the hostile Indians in that area. I say hostile because the purpose of his uh, volunteering was to try to go out ahead of the army and, uh, and talk to these uh, tribes who were raising forces to fight the pioneers, the soldiers, and the United States proper. He, he wanted to get out there and talk to them and try to talk them out of uh, doing what they were doing and settle their problems peacefully because he knew what happened to the Winnebago's. They were put in this concentration camp and uh, they were not treated very much like humans. And so this was his purpose to start with. And he, when he used the term, they're going to play like men, why he uh, knew what he was facing, that they were going to battle. So the battle they must, they were going to battle to either conquer these people or let them know that uh, what he was saying was he meant business, that they're going to quit uh, these little skirmishes and harassment of the, the pioneers, the settlers, and oh, whatever progress was coming. He wanted to put that down so that everybody would be living in harmony. So this is what his purpose was to join the army or volunteer. But it got to a point where he was doing all the fighting, he, he and his men, uh, seemingly. I mean, I, he, I read some of the notes and history. Someone writes about, and <clears throat> excuse me, they uh, men make mention of little priest or to make mention of the Omaha Scouts. Very small items here and there we find in some of the books that uh, we're still looking for some books that we haven't discovered, some other writers that might be writing uh, about ancient history, I guess we might call it now. If we come across those things, we are trained to gather. Uh, that's the white man's side of the story, and we have the Indian side. We thought sometime 
we get enough material, we will put them together. Uh, each one talking them as they see the thing from their side of the fence. <laughs>